The Lord be with you. I'm going to try something here in a minute, in a second. So, you know, on the pastor side of things, there are mornings when you like, you like, you wake up and you're like, nobody is going to show up this morning. <laughs> so let me just tell you how very glad and thankful I am that you are here this morning. Uh, we have a full choir and, uh, and y'all have uh, gotten out there and beat the rain in a sense. You didn't let the rain discourage you or keep you from coming to worship. But when it rains, you remember that you are a baptized child of God, that Jesus has washed away all your sins, that you're joined to Jesus in the water of holy baptism, and you just march out there whether you've got your galoshes on or not, and you show up because you're not going to melt. So thank you for doing that. I was concerned that we weren't going to have any kids for Sunday school, but it turns out we had six kids in Sunday school and uh, this is a little video of uh, them. I'm not sure if the sound is going to work. We're going to try this. Um, we may just be watching them dance. Let's, or they, they sing in a song. And let's see. So, um, You have to use your, we, we make fantastic use of our imaginations in Sunday school. And you have to use your imagination uh, that you can hear the children singing uh, their songs in Sunday school. And so today, uh, which of the kids now, uh, most of the kids are here, uh, what, was, uh, what was our theme today that we were talking about? God doesn't want us to get hurt, and then we talked about God's ten big rules so that we don't get hurt. Um, and uh, for Sunday school, we use God's ten big rules, but of course you and I probably learned those as, God, as the Ten Commandments, and over time they'll learn them as the Ten Commandments too. But uh, that was really a positive thing for us to uh, come and to have six children here for Sunday school today, and... Uh, what, what a great blessing, um, what a great blessing the children are, and thank you parents and grandparents for bringing the kids. That makes our day, and uh, we're very glad for that, so glad you all were here. In your bulletins on the back, you know, the prayer list has been updated there, and I would just draw your attention to uh, one name on the list. Uh, it's a matter of uh, praise, uh, Phyllis. Um, you know that Phyllis uh, Geisinger has been in the hospital, was in the hospital because uh, of uh, a hiatal hernia that the doctors repaired, and then she's been in um, rehabilitation there at Wesley. Um, they've done a great job. She's been a great patient, and of course, if you go to visit Phyllis, uh, you know that you end up leaving the room ministered to. So you might go into the room saying, oh, I'm going to minister and bring encouragement to Phyllis. But by the time that you leave the room, you realize that God's been using her uh, in this ministry all along. Uh, I took her a, a, a bag of crosses to give away this week. Not just like, oh, here's a couple, but a whole bag of crosses. Um, so she's doing God's work even uh, from the hospital bed. She's doing so well that she should be released on uh, Monday, maybe Tuesday of this week. So uh, we're giving uh, praise to God for that. And uh, so that'll be included in our prayers. Uh, thank you uh, to those who have gone by to visit, to those who have called. Um, she'll be going back to her house uh, in Lamar County for a little while. And then she has plans to uh, move uh, to Tyler, Texas, to be close to her daughter uh, there. And... Uh, so that's, that's a great blessing that God continues to work these things. So special shout out to Pat Davenport because Pat has been uh, a number one caregiver there. And that's a huge, huge blessing. 
Uh, would you look please at page 13 at the top? Page 13 at the top has uh, the avenues. It's the second uh, uh, announcement, the avenues Halloween parade outreach. Um, let me tell you uh, how this works. Um, we uh, receive money from Thrivent Financial. Then we take that money and we go and buy hot dogs and waters and things like that. And then we, uh, we put this opportunity because half of Hattiesburg is going to be right here on Thursday night. So if you had half of the town come to you, what would you do? Would you stay home? Would you hide? Would you run away? No, you would go out and you would feed them because they're hungry and because they're, they're about to get so much candy, <laughs> right? So uh, we feed them and we give, them, give away free hot dogs and free waters and bless the neighborhood. I mean, that's kind of you know, why we're here is to bless the neighborhood and the neighborhood is coming to us. In fact, it's a little known fact and, and I'm glad that they didn't let it out in the recent campaign but it's a little known fact that the whole construct of Halloween and the Halloween parade is just to get people to come by our church building. <laughs> Do not fail me in this, right? So how many people, this is how many people does it take to give away, I don't know how many we gave away last year, 150, maybe 200. How many people does it take to give away 150 hot dogs and waters? However many it takes. It takes about 80 to 90 people to do that. <laughs> right? Because this is about the opportunity to reach out and bless the neighborhood. Right? So it's not about, oh, it might take five people. Right? Well, if there were only five people in the congregation, fine. <laughs> but it's about the opportunity to reach out and bless the neighborhood. Some of you have never come out to a congregational outreach opportunity event thing like this. I'm not naming names this Sunday. <laughs> but here's your opportunity on Thursday night to come out. It's We're going to start cooking. Pat's done this. Yes. It's fun. You just get to bless. They're like, what? It's free? It doesn't cost you? You're like, yeah, it's free. Take it. And you get to eat a hot dog, too. If Ron Johnson is here, you'll get, to, you know, you'll get to hear him use his outside voice with the kids. <laughs> it's just a great opportunity. The thing to do is to try and be here by 4.30 if your work schedule allows that, right? If, did you catch that part? If your work schedule allows that, then try to be here by 4.30. If you don't have a work schedule, all right, you're, you're feeling the pressure now, okay? Okay, this Thursday, 5.30, is the time the parade rolls. So if you get started this way on Hardy Street or from the pedal side and Hardy, Hardy Street's blocked, the nice thing about the avenues is there are all kinds of alternate routes to get here. I, I just, I don't know what excuse you have to bless. All right. And on the next page to the left, page 12, look at those first three things and then we're starting Page 12 at the top, wear red next Sunday because we're celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation next Sunday. And Reformation Sunday is a festival of the Holy Spirit, so the colors on the altar are going to be red. You wear red too. And after worship, we're having a brief congregational meeting. It'll be our last congregational meeting to prepare for the district convention coming up next spring. And then... Uh, in the afternoon is our Mississippi Gulf Coast Reformation 500 celebration. That's what's in the block there. Now, that is uh, all of our congregations from Circuit 14. So we're the northernmost. We have to travel a bit, but it's easy to get there. You just go down to Gulfport and hang a left on Pass Road. And you go to Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd in Biloxi. And the worship service there is at 4 o'clock. 
the choir, I don't know if you heard them practicing this morning, the choir has been practicing a piece that they're going to sing next Sunday in our worship service, and then uh, choir members from all the congregations in the circuit have been invited to come down and to sing that as a mass choir. Now this is the thing is, I want you, what I want you to do next Sunday, here's the plan, is uh, you come to church, you come to worship, and um, then you go out to eat at one of our nice local restaurants, and then you get in the car with somebody else from this church. Don't just go by yourself. I mean, that's nice. You can drive faster. Nobody's paying attention, right? But ride with somebody else from here to go down there and be a part of this. But I want you to arrive early because the seating capacity of the church there is only 250 people and they want to pack the church. So uh, plan to come to worship here, go out to eat, ride down there with somebody else and uh, be there early because the seating capacity is only 250. Come participate in that, all right? Be a part of something bigger. You'll go down there for all kinds of other things. And you'll go up to Jackson, or you'll go over to Natchez, or somewhere else for all kinds of things. All right. At the top of page three is our gathering prayer. This morning, won't you stand with me as we pray together? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning in Jesus' name, we pray all that we say and do in our worship will give you glory. Help us, Lord, to focus our thoughts on you so your word will find fertile ground in our minds and hearts. May the worship service today accomplish in us the purpose you desire. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. Since we gather to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace, 
for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism, you declared us to be your children, gathered us in your one holy church in which you daily and richly forgive our sins and grant us new life through your spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Apostle Creed. This is the faith into which we have been baptized and by which we live. Believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day goes again. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. We pray together. O oh God, the person of all who trust in you, have mercy on us, that we with you as we ruler and God. We may so pass through the things temporal and the lose not the things that are eternal. Jesus Christ, our Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading, the Old Testament reading for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah, chapter 45. God uses Cyrus the Great, pagan king of Persia, to accomplish his purpose for the sake of his missionary people, even calling Cyrus his anointed one, a prefiguring of Jesus, the coming Messiah. Thus says the Lord to his, his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to lose the bells of kings, to open doors before him and gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and of the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who called you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me, I am the Lord. And there is no other besides me. There is no God, I equip you. Though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all things. This is the word of the Lord. During these Sundays, we are focusing on the red-letter words and deeds of Jesus in the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Jesus cuts through the entangling false flattery of those who would undermine his kingdom and ties them up with their own rope. 
Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his talk. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and whose inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
My brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, I have a question for you. It's not my intent to bring up any terrible memories, but I just want to ask you if you've ever been or you've ever seen somebody else, and for this morning it counts if you've seen it on TV, attacked by a swarm of bees. Have you ever been attacked by a swarm of bees or seen someone or seen it on TV? And what, what do they do? What do you do when you're attacked by a swarm of bees? Right? Yeah. Or you run. Yep. Because you want to get the bees away. Right? Do you know that has something to do with today's gospel? In Matthew chapter 22, it's kind of like Jesus is being attacked by a swarm of bees, except they're not called bees. L let, me, let me tell you. I'm just going to read a few of the passages, the situations that Matthew records for us right here in his gospel, chapter 22. Now, the first of them we had last Sunday. You remember last Sunday, right? Some of you weren't even here and you're remembering. It. <laughs> uh, them. Uh, just that, say a word about them, right? The them, right? We're reading the gospel. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, and you're like, well, who's the them? called the antecedent. That's your grammar lesson for today. It's the reference before. Who's the them? That's uh, two verses earlier. It says in chapter 21, verse 45, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew that he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Did the uh, chief priests and the Pharisees hold that Jesus was a prophet? No, but the people did, and that was the second problem. The first problem was that they didn't hold that he was a prophet, and the second problem was the people did. Jesus spoke to them again in parables. There's the first them. It's over here. It's the Pharisees buzzing and attacking Jesus and the chief priests buzzing and attacking Jesus as he teaches the people in the portico of the temple. That was last Sunday. Uh, and it went on from there about the, son, the king who had a son and prepared a banquet for his son's wedding, and the invited guests came up with excuses why they couldn't come, why other things were a priority, um, and they did some uh, terrible things, and the king takes care of them, shall we say. And uh, then the king goes out to the highways and the byways, to all the main streets and all the back alleys, and he invites who? The good and lucky for you and me, the bad. That's where we come in. And uh, then the wedding hall is filled. That was last Sunday. Here's this Sunday, the gospel. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his word. Great, the Pharisees now, uh, they've been attacking him, but they weren't successful, so now they're going to work behind the scenes. So who do they send in? The newbies. They send in their disciples, right? So uh, just so you're keeping track here, all right? Uh, chief priests, the Pharisees. Now the disciples are going in to attack Jesus, the Pharisees' disciples, right? And you're like, what? There are other disciples? Yeah. Jesus has disciples. 
John the Baptist has disciples, and the Pharisees have disciples. Now they're sending in their disciples to go get Jesus. They were the, the good guys who knew all this stuff. They weren't successful. They got rebuffed. So they're like, oh, we're going to you know, nurse our wounds. Let's send in the little guys. And who else? The Herodians. The Herodians. So that's group number four. The Herodians are the people who are allied with Herod. And... Um, they, this is uh, important because, see, in order for their trap to work, they're going to have to have people on both sides so that no matter what answer Jesus gives, they've got them. And so they've sent in, sent in the Herodians in case Jesus says, don't pay your taxes because then the Herodians are going to get them because the Herodians were allied with the Romans and they were the ones keeping King Herod, not King Herod the Great when Jesus was a baby, but this is one of his sons. They're the one keeping King Herod in power even though they're under the Roman authorities, right? So if Jesus says uh, no to their question, the Herod Herodians are going to get him and report him to the Romans and their work will be taken care of, and Jesus will be out of the picture. But if uh, Jesus says uh, yes, then their disciples are going to get him, and he'll be in big doo-doo uh, with them, and they're going to get him, and then they'll be able to kick him out of the temple, and they'll be done with Jesus, right? Because that's what this is about, is how do we get rid of Jesus? From the beginning of chapter 21, the main objective has been, how do we get rid of this guy? So we're going to lay a trap for this guy to get rid of him. Now, how many do we have involved so far? We've got the Pharisees, the chief priests, the Pharisees' disciples, and the Herodians. Next Sunday, the appointed text from Matthew chapter 22 is the next passage. There are five of these things in Matthew chapter 22. Five different times where they're swarming in to get Jesus. The problem with that uh, next Sunday is that it's Reformation Sunday. And when Reformation Sunday happens, uh, then they bring in other texts and we don't get to hear the story as it goes from Sunday to Sunday to Sunday. Now, I told you there are five of these texts, right? So last Sunday we had one. Uh, this Sunday we have number two, but we're going to miss three, four, and five, which is why I'm glad that you're here today, because I'm going to preach three more sermons so that you get all of Matthew chapter 22, if that's okay with you, all right? Here's the next passage, because you're keeping track of how many people are attacking Jesus. This is Matthew 22, verse 23. That same, okay, so if you didn't get it, right, what happened at the end of the second encounter is Jesus rebuffs them, they marvel, and they go away, right? Just like what happened in the first one. Now, the third one is the Sadducees come in. Now, there are four different parties, so to speak, among the Jews, right? There are four different divisions. We think this way, we think this way, we think this way, right? Oh, that's all right. We're familiar with that. One of the parties is the Pharisees, another party is the Essenes, another party is the Zealots, but the other big party is the Sadducees. Now normally, these things are kind of oil and water, and the two don't really like each other, right? But uh, let's see how the saying goes is... Um, The enemy of my enemy is my friend, something like that, or a friend of my friend is my enemy. I don't know. You, you know what I'm saying? So the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they don't, you know, they don't normally really get along. They don't play well together, you know, you know, keep them apart. But let me tell you, they're both allied about one objective, which is to get rid of Jesus. So what happens is the chief priests fail. The Pharisees fail. The Pharisees' disciples fail, and the Herodians fail. I guess we're going to have to ask the black sheep of the family, which are the Sadducees. 
And that's what they do. That same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, come to Jesus with a question. Well, they ask him about the resurrection, which is just the most incredible thing, right? They don't believe in the resurrection, but they go to question Jesus about the resurrection. And Jesus replies back to them, you don't understand God or his power. He's got this all taken care of. And they leave sad because they are Sadducees. So they leave sad. <laughs> Encounter number four. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees said, oh shucks. And they get back together and they recruit. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Now, personally, I have nothing against lawyers. Some of the best lawyers are members of our congregation. <laughs> but you might remember scripturally, especially if you're familiar with the Revised Standard Version or the King James Version, lawyers are all over the place. It's like going downtown. There's a law office everywhere you turn around. Just like that in the scriptures, the lawyers are all over the place, right? So what the Pharisees do is they consult some lawyers. Because if we can't do it on our own, my goodness, let's get a lawyer to help us. What's their objective? Get rid of Jesus. So they send in the lawyers. Now... Before I tell you what happened with the lawyers, let me just say this. In case you have, for any reason at all, really, a distaste for lawyers, do this. When you get up in the morning or when you go to bed at night, just look in the mirror. Because the truth is, there's a little bit of lawyer in all of us. We like to take the law and apply it to somebody else, and to measure them up like we're some kind of carpenter with a measuring stick or a tape measure. And we pull out our lawyer in us tape measure, and we hold it up to our neighbor or our spouse or our child or our parent, and we say, oh my goodness, look how far short you've fallen of my expectations. You must be a really bad person, which is just the most delightful thing, that Jesus gets to encounter the lawyers, which also means that he gets to encounter you and me in his little battle in Matthew chapter 22 in the temple courts that day. Do you know how well the lawyers did? Zero, right? They say to him, oh, Jesus, which is the most beautiful law in all the scriptures? And Jesus says, oh, that's easy. Get this. He says to the ones who love the law, remember looking in the mirror in the morning, he says to the ones who love the law, the most important law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And just in case you get like lost in this like, oh, I'm just going to love the Lord today and theory stuff, he says, the other side of the coin is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, because it's really easy, isn't it? Just to love the Lord. We're just going to go love the Lord today and walk right past your neighbor in need. And so Jesus, watch this, Jesus always ties those two things together because they're one side each of the same coin. And the lawyers were frustrated in the law, and they went away. So we've got, let's see, just going to check in here, all right? 
Pharisees, chief priests, disciples of the Pharisees, Herodians, Sadducees, Pharisees again who recruited the lawyers this time because their disciples and the Herodians didn't do so well. Fifth encounter, finally the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the most popular. They're the ones in charge and in control. They're running the ship. So they come back around and they say to Jesus, part five of Matthew chapter 22, they ask Jesus, no, Jesus asks them, oh, look at this, he begins with a question. What do you think about the Christ, the Messiah, whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls the Messiah Lord, how can he be his son? And here's the deal for us on this, is we don't see the cultural slope that is written into this. Because the cultural slope of this is honor, it's like the fourth commandment. Honor and respect is always due up the slope, right? You honor your parents who honor their parents, which, and goes up the slope those who are older. But what Jesus is saying that David was doing is honoring the Messiah who was his descendant down the slope. And that would have never happened in good Jewish theology or practice. In good Jewish theology, it's kind of like what we learned about um, Puritan American children, right? When the Puritans came over, and there was a child, I don't know if you did this when I was in, I don't know, first or second grade, right? You had to draw the little pilgrims with the hats at Thanksgiving, right? And there were children there, and, 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 and the children are silent until they are spoken to. Do you remember that? Children are silent. I see parents and aunts are reaching over to their kid now and say, hey, listen to the pastor. <laughs> children are silent until they are spoken to because it had that downward slope culturally, except what Jesus is saying is that David realized that the Messiah who came after him, who is down the slope, is his Lord. This whole chapter, believe it or not, this whole chapter has to do with this question. The question for all of these, the Pharisees, chief priests, disciples, Sadducees, lawyers, Herodians, Pharisees again and again and again and again is, who's the guy teaching in the temple? Who's the guy teaching in the temple? you imagine that if they realized who they were dealing with, if they would have even tried any of these shenanigans? It's like some crazy show to read Matthew chapter 22 because they don't get it, who they're dealing with. So they can come buzzing and attacking him with all their different tricks and traps and temptations and theological rabbit holes. You know, that's what the Sadducees. The man didn't have a child. You know, he gets married, the, the wife gets married to all seven brothers. There's no children. Who's, who's, uh, who's going to be the husband in the resurrection by the Sadducees who don't even believe in the resurrection? Do you know who you're dealing with here? Look at the front of your bulletin, please. On the front of your bulletin is a denarius. 
On the one side uh, is the image of the uh, emperor, um, I think that's the emperor Tiberius. Uh, so uh, normally the Romans did not put the image of a living emperor or Caesar on their coins. But I tell you what happens. When a man gets full enough of himself, he lets things happen that he normally wouldn't let happen. And so Caesar Augustus, anybody heard of this guy? If you've heard of Caesar Augustus, raise your right hand and solemnly swear that you've been in church and heard Luke chapter 2 once or twice in your life. Because when Luke writes his gospel chapter 2, he gives us the date of Jesus' birth and the date of Jesus' baptism by referencing first Caesar Augustus for his birth and then Tiberius for Jesus' ministry, right? And Caesar Augustus got a little bit full of himself or out of control or whatever, and Caesar Augustus let his image be put on the denarius that is used to pay for the tax, and that had never been done by the Roman rulers before. And Caesar Tiberius, claiming that there was precedent, let his name and image be put on the Roman coin, even though he's still alive. It's like tempting death to do such a thing. On the cover of your bulletin is a Roman denarius with the image and the name of Tiberius on it, who is the Caesar. And this is the kind of coin that Jesus would have had them bring forward, and he would have put them in front of, put that in front of them, and he said, Do you know who you're dealing with here? And he tossed the coin back at them because they're coming in at him, guns blazing. And he takes the coin and he says, if it's Caesar's, give it to him. And he turns and he walks out. Right? Nod your head if you think I'm right. I'm not. I'm just seeing if you're paying attention and if you're going along with me here. He doesn't turn around and walk out. He tosses the coin back to them who would trap him by this coin. And then he lowers the boom. Give to God what is God's. We talked about this in our Sunday school class this morning. Right? Tessa and Cheyenne. Because we talked, they're like, we did? <laughs> Because we talked about the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before you. And God doesn't want us to get hurt. And when we put other things before him, we are destined to get hurt. And if we put Caesar before him, we are destined to get hurt. And the whole big thing about Caesar was people were claiming that he is Lord. You see, this living man had claimed to be Lord. Uh, you remember, sometimes you're driving down the highway. Here's a little excursus you don't have to pay extra for. <coughs> sometimes you're tooling down the highway and the person in front of you is a little bit slow. And you're about to, like, cuss them out under your breath for driving so slow, except they have one of these fish things stuck to their back of their vehicle, right? You've seen those fish things on the back, right? And then you're like, ugh, it's a Christian. <laughs> I know. Because I've looked in the mirror this morning. The first confession of those who would follow Jesus is the simplest. It's Jesus is Lord. Because everybody else was saying, Caesar is Lord. Give to Caesar what's his. But don't mess with me. 
give to God what is his. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, this is what God says. Chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man humankind in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and of the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created humankind in his image, in the image of God, He created him. That's why human life is sacred. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every creature that moves upon the ground. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning. The sixth day. You and I were created in God's image. We're not God's. Let's not mess up the first commandment. But we are created in his image. What happened? What happened at the end of today's passage after they marveled? What did they do? They left Jesus and went away. Matthew says, they left Jesus and went away. Yeah, they went and regrouped. They went and recruited the Sadducees and stuff like this. But they left. What did Adam and Eve do in the garden? They left God and went away when they decided they would like to be more like God than they already were, when they quested to be in his place, they left him and they tarnished the image of God. And Adam and Eve were no longer the perfect image of God. And you and I, in our leaving God, tarnish his image. So God, in his plan, first revealed again in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, says, okay, I see I'm going to have to go down there myself. And he lays plans to go down there himself. But he says, I'm going to do this from the beginning, in a sense, the right way or the complete way. And so he does. When by the power of the Holy Spirit, Mary conceives a son, And God is born in Bethlehem. And God grows in wisdom and stature before God and men. And God is baptized in the Jordan River. And then God serves and God heals and God teaches and God preaches and God brings his kingdom. The people looking see Jesus But if they knew who they were dealing with, they would see God. Brothers and sisters, your tarnish, your tarnish and your brokenness, your love from measuring tapes to measure your neighbor or your spouse, your children, your parents, your love for the law, Your sadness when you doubt the resurrection. Your chiefness of wanting to be in charge of just about everything, having control. All of that's been redeemed and redone by the one who is the very image and the very likeness of God, even the Messiah, Jesus. 
so that when we see him on the cross, we do not see only Jesus, who in appearances was a man. But Paul says to us, he is God who humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in the earth, under the earth, above the heavens, everyone will confess that Jesus Christ is, finish the sentence, Jesus Christ is Caesar? No. The president? No. Whatever it is that you would put before him, no. Gets tossed back. Let him have it. If it's Caesar's coin, give it back to Caesar. Who gives a care? But give to God the things that are God's. They may have walked away, but God didn't. God didn't walk away from his creation. He didn't walk away from those who bear his image, even though that image be tarnished. He redeemed it. He saved it. He claimed it. We're about to walk out of this place. I wish I were one of those good mathematicians. I could tell you how many hours it is until we walk back into this place next week. But in those, let's just say it's a billion hours between now and then, a round number. In those billion hours between now and next Sunday at 1030, you're going out there and you're bearing an image. By the power of the Holy Spirit working in you and by the redemption of your life by Jesus Christ, and by the creation of you by God the Father, and his imprimatur, his stamp or impression on your heart and your life, you are bearing the image of God. Not as one who should be carried in a carriage like the Queen of England, but as one who serves, as the one who takes off his outer robe and grabs a towel, and washes his disciples' feet. Because in a sense, the world ought to know who it's messing with. We go bearing the image of God, carrying our buckets of blessing to shower blessing on the world. Not as the Gentiles do who would lord it over others, but as our Savior does, who washes feet. Would you find that hymn that we just sang, please? It's on page six. You open your bulletins at the hymn, page six. And when you find page six, then find the hymn and and stanza three. Sometimes we feel we're all alone in this, bearing the image of God to the world. Let me tell you, that's a lie. It's the devil's lie to separate us and then destroy us. But it's a lie. Lo, the apostles' holy train join thy sacred name to hallow. Prophets swell the glad refrain, and the white-robed martyrs follow. And from morn to set of sun, through the church, the song goes on. And we leave this place, redeemed people of God, bearing the image of God, We are the church. 
This is a building, but this building is not the church. This building was not created in the image of God. You were. You were created in the image of God. And as you leave this place, the church leaves this place and carries out into the world the image of God. And the world better know who it's messing with. Because this God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to die for it in its place to restore it to the Father, and to win our hearts, our souls again. Won't you stand with me to pray? <laughs> Heavenly Father, when we come to understand who we're messing with, We fall down and we claim with Isaiah, we are not worthy. Oh Lord, do not even touch me, for I would be consumed. You are a holy fire. And yet you reach out to your people again and again. You come with your polishing cloth. You knock off the rough edges and you restore the dents and the dings and all the things that make us less than you have created and redeemed us to be. Come with your holy saliva and spit on us again that we might see. Poke your fingers in our ears that we might hear and reach out and place your hand upon our chests that we might feel and that we might believe and that our hearts might beat warm and strong and whole again. Loosen our hands, quiet our anxiety, speed up our feet and make us strong again. Not for our own sakes or for our glory, but for your glory that people might see and might give you the praise and that your word and your image might go forth as one who serves a God of grace, for this is your glory. You have loved the world. You have not left and departed and run away and hidden, but you have made yourself known in your Son. So, rain down your Holy Spirit upon your people, let the bees and the buzzing and the attacks take flight. Let the devil hide for fear of exposure. Renew your church. May the song go on, Lord, in your mercy. We praise your name for the healing that you have brought to Phyllis and to others who recover from sickness and disease and despair and depression and affliction and addictions of every kind. For you would stop the spread of evil and you would renew your creation by your Son. So accomplish this in us, we pray, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers, we pray, on behalf of children. Our children, of course, but our neighbor's children, the children around us. May we intercede for them. May we do what is right by them. May we raise up all of those who are far from you, who are powerless in our society, in our culture. May we stop the blame and solve the problems. Lord, in your mercy, Heavenly Father, grant your holy angels protection to those who serve in the armed forces of our nation and to those who are serve our community as first responders. Protect them, we pray, by your mercy, Lord, in your mercy. And feed us once more here at this altar, your grace, your favor, your forgiveness, your welcome. 
that we who are blessed at this place might be fully equipped to carry your image and your blessing into the world all the billions of hours before we come here again and worship and receive from your hand your grace. For the one who was dead is now alive, and he lives and reigns with you, Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We gather our offerings to the Lord. In your service folder, the Lord's Prayer begins at the bottom of page 7. Lord Jesus Christ, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth and as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Behold the grace of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for yours. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way also after supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you. 
This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you for the remission of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
stand to pray. All praise to you, O Christ, for love whose depth and height, whose length and breadth fill time and space with endless life and light. For you live and reign, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, we're ready. We have been blessed. We have received the very body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our image is being polished and renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are about to head out into the world, buckets full of blessing. Let's make sure that they're topped off and spilling. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The buckets are meant to spill, okay? It's not keep the blessing in the bucket. The buckets are meant to spill. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace.